I asked a preacher like you one time, how long does it take to build a church? He said, a lifetime, boy, a lifetime. That's why there ain't many being built. <laughs> he kind of growled everything. <laughs> I love preacher like you. He had about 35 people and he bought a Greyhound busload of singers and musicians and and preachers and our parking lot filled up with cars. He had a three-time world champion banjo player with him, Brother Larry Richardson. And the guy that he was beating out all three of those years was Earl Scruggs. And it always frustrated Earl Scruggs that he couldn't beat Larry Richardson in banjo playing. And Earl Scruggs made all the money. And Larry Richardson got saved and played for the Lord. So, what great memories. Do the will of God. Amen. He will give you so many great memories. You'll meet some great people. You'll have some great experiences. Uh, you'll, you'll have things that the world has never even thought about. And you'll have it because you serve the Lord. I've heard quite a few messages in my life on how to find the will of God. But I always like to preach in a way that people will, will respond to what I preach. So rather than preach on how to find the will of God, I'd like to preach on how to miss the will of God. That way somebody will get it. <laughs> Acts chapter number 27 how to miss the will of God. This is in case you really don't want to do it. Here's, a, here's you a blueprint. <laughs> Acts chapter number 27. I better see what time it is here. Let me read just verse 13 for my text. And then we'll back up and work our way back to it. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. How to miss the will of God. You know, there's a great theological argument about what I'm about to say. Was Paul in the will of God or out of the will of God going to Rome? And uh, <clears throat> there was a man that told him by the Spirit of God, don't go. That's what your King James Bible says. They told him, by the Spirit of God, don't go. But you know, preachers can be some stubborn cusses. And Paul just had it in his heart and mind, he was going. And so, God did use him in a great way, he built a church in Rome and got a chance to testify in front of all those government officials and get the gospel to a lot of people. So even if he missed, even if Paul missed the will of God, he made the most of his miss. I can't help but admire that and respect that a little bit. Because I know a lot of men who missed, and once they realized they had missed, they got discouraged and quit. That's, that's not what you do. Amen. You're going to miss. Nobody bats a thousand. You're going to miss. 
But you don't get discouraged and quit. You just keep seeking after the Lord, desiring to do His will, and you just keep plugging away at what God has you doing. So the Apostle Paul finds himself under the authority of an unsaved man who missed the will of God. And Paul, as being under this unsaved man's authority, simply submits himself to the authority of this unsaved man. You know, I find that Bible believers kind of struggle with that a little bit. Pastor, you know, I'm going to have to quit that job. I said, well, why are you going to have to quit your job? Uh, my boss, he's just a lost man. Whoa, 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 whoa. What does that have to do with anything? Well, he cusses. and uh, Well, he's a lost man. You don't quit your job because, you're lost, because your boss is a lost man. You just do your job. Do what he tells you to do. If you don't want to be under the authority of a lost man, start your own business, then you can be the boss and you can run it any way you want to. But if you're going to work for another man, you just do your job and do what you're told. And the Apostle Paul finds himself in this chapter under the authority of Julius. Let's back up to verse number 1. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. This, this man's not a flunky. A centurion has authority over at least a hundred elite troops. We might call them special forces today. He was a responsible man because he had authority over all these fighters. He was a respectable man because he did give the Apostle Paul quite a bit of liberty on this journey that you wouldn't normally give a prisoner. And entering into a ship of Adramidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul. He was a respectable man. He didn't treat a prisoner like most authorities would treat prisoners today. And they may have deserved some ill treatment, by their attitude and behavior. But you know, it just doesn't hurt to be courteous to people as long as the situation will allow you to do that. I know sometimes we have to get a little short with people, a little blunt with people, because they're not responding to courtesy. But as long as possible, operate within the boundaries of courtesy. Especially if you are in authority over someone else. Don't flaunt your authority in people's face. Be courteous, and they'll know who's in charge. He courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go under his friends and to refresh himself. The word liberty is seldom put in context with a prisoner. Yet Paul is being treated courteously. He has some liberty. And I'm saying all this to say this man, Julius, even though he was a very responsible man and a, a, a leader and a man of authority, and yet he's still being courteous and respectable and giving liberty to a prisoner when he didn't have to do that. He could have just had him shackled down underneath the bow, underneath the deck of the boat. Or anything he wanted to do. Verse 4, And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. 
And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmoni. And hardly passing by, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. And when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phinasi, and there to winter, which is the haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sail close by Crete. Julius did not have the Word of God. Julius did not have the Spirit of God. But Julius did have a man of God on board. And this man of God had a message from God that was very important to Julius, whether he believed that or not. You know when a man of God opens this book and gets up and starts preaching, it's a good idea to listen. You just might get something that you don't even realize how much it's going to help you in your situation. You may even think it's, you've already got something all figured out, but it'd probably be a good idea to listen to the message and ask God if there's something in that message that might could help you and be a blessing to you. And so Julius misses the will of God because he just won't listen to the man of God with a message from God. No doubt he believed he had more experience in such matters, more knowledge in such matters. And some people have a hard time listening to a pastor as he's been a preacher all his life and maybe he hasn't been out there and worked in the real world. So they're thinking, what does he know? I've been doing this all my life. I know what I'm doing. But God just might give your preacher a message for you that is not in his arena of expertise, but God gave him the message anyway. Now, here's how Julius missed the will of God. Be, be sure and take notes so you'll know how to miss Number one, they launched out in impatience. They were in too big of a hurry. I could give you a, a list this long of illustrations that I've seen through the years of people who just got in too big of a hurry. And they missed the will of God and they wrecked their home and they wrecked their ministry. They wrecked their life because I got to do something. I got to do something. I got to do something. I can't do it right now. No, no, no. Just slow down. Just stop. It's not that big of a hurry. Hey, people are dying and going to hell. I need to hurry up and get over there. And they've been dying and going to hell for millenniums. You think you're going to stop that Niagara Falls of souls dropping off into hell? You might get one or two. You might get 10 or 20. But don't get in such a hurry that you miss the will of God. Maybe you need a little more time to be prepared. Or maybe your family needs a little more time to accept this big change that's coming into their life. In either way, you would be well advised to seek God, find His will, not only what He wants you to do, but when He wants you to do it. 
the timing is just as important as what to do, if not more important. You need to know when. He got impatient. He was a man of authority. Maybe he wanted to make a good impression on his, his authority, his supervisor. And if you're talking about a move of your family to another location, maybe to the mission field, maybe to another church, maybe to a Bible school or a Bible institute, if you're talking about moving your family you better find the will of God and you better take your time and make sure you're getting this right because your whole future depends on you getting it right. You got to get it right. And that, that woman that you married, if you're not careful, you'll make a bad decision and she'll follow you and it'll be a disaster. And then you'll make another impulsive decision and she'll follow you, and it'll be a disaster. And a third time's a charm. You're going to make another bad decision, and she's going to say, uh, no, I don't think I'm going this time. It's kind of like the story I heard Doug Fisher tell about Tarzan and Jane. Me, Tarzan, you, Jane, you follow me. Oh, Bam! And he hits a tree. And Jane's standing there watching, thinking, hmm, I don't know about this. <laughs> so Tarzan, he comes back around and gets in the tree. Me, Tarzan, you, Jane, you follow me. Oh, bam, right into another tree. He comes back and says, Jane, are you going to follow me or not? She said, me, Jane, you take Cheetah. Now, the point of that illustration is simply this. You make enough bad decisions, that woman's going to get skittish. Every time you tell her, I prayed about this, this is the will of God, here's what we're going to do. Mm. That's how you miss the will of God, cowboy. Get to where you are your own God. Whatever you think, whatever you say, whatever you believe is your personal final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Unfortunately, King James, Independent Baptist, Bible believers are the world's worst at that. They say they believe this is the final authority, but this is their final authority. It's what they think that really matters. So he launched out in impatience. If you're going to have a ministry and try to be a blessing to the church, you're going to have to have proven yourself to be a man or a woman of patience. Because people will try to get under your skin. Even in a church. And you're going to have to be patient with the most annoying, obnoxious, headstrong people that you've ever met in your life. Now they're going to try to be sweet about it. That's their first try. Then they're going to be a little more assertive in the next go round. Then they're going to be demanding. And then they're going to lay down ultimatums. Oh, if you don't let me do this, I'm out of here. You just got rid of a problem. That's when you go home, get on your knees and say, Thank you, Lord. You are so good to me. Praise the Lord. Bless them as they go out here and create their own disaster. Okay. I'm talking about how to miss this is if you want to miss the will of God. Just be impatient. Here's what Isaiah said, Isaiah 40 verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Waiting on the Lord is actually a way to strengthen yourself. You're not losing time. You're not getting weaker. You're getting stronger when you're waiting on the Lord because the Lord has more strength than you can ever muster. And He can touch people's hearts in a way that you will never be able to touch people's hearts. If you don't wait on the Lord, your strength will be gone. And the job that you have, you're going to need strength. And God will promise to give you the strength, His strength, a strength that is sufficient. So it is of a necessity that you wait for God's timing when it comes to education. We have a young man in our church. He went to our Christian school. He graduated. He wanted to be a doctor. I don't even know how many years ago he graduated. But it's been years that he's been on this path. He's never gotten in a hurry. He's never been worried. He did something like two years of cancer research. After he'd done his schooling, which was years, now he's doing a residency. He's going to do a two-year residency working under some kind of reconstructive surgery. You're in a bad car accident and your face is all distorted and misshaped and he's going to be the surgeon that goes in there and puts it all back together and straightens it out. He's two years away now, a little less, of realizing his dream that he believes is God's will for his life. That takes some patience. If we had more people in the ministry who would have that kind of patience, just wait on God and trust in God and be diligent and faithful at what they're supposed to be doing while they're getting ready, oh, we would have some powerhouse preachers of the gospel and church builders. But people get in too big of a hurry. So the first thing is impatience will cause you to miss the will of God. Verse number 10, And he said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. The centurion, Julius listened to some bad advice. You really ought to be careful asking people for advice. I know there's a time that you need to ask for advice, but you've got to be careful who you ask for advice and which advice you listen to and which advice you ignore. Now, Eve listened to Satan's bad advice. Got us all into trouble. Abraham got some advice from Sarah on getting a promised seed. Look, just take Hagar. Let's just work this out. Okay. No, not okay. Still fighting to this day the descendants of Ishmael and Isaac. Bad idea. Listen to bad advice. Young man of God, listen to an old prophet's bad advice in 1 Kings chapter 13. And you see him dead in a ditch, killed by a lion, because he listened to an old preacher's bad advice. Be careful of an old preacher who used to be a man of God, but now all he has is memories of being a man of God. This centurion listened to the ship master and owner. No doubt he felt they know more about sailing than a prisoner would know, especially a preacher who is a prisoner. 
I'm just guessing that if they let a prisoner in here in shackles today and it was a preacher and Brother Carlson called on him to preach, somebody would probably be scratching their head. I'm not listening to this guy. He's a convict. You've got to be careful about that kind of attitude. I'm not saying it's good to be a convict. I'm just saying Paul was a convict. He was a prisoner. And no doubt Julius thought he was being wise, listening to the shipmaster and owner more than listening to a jailbird preacher. But instead, he listened to bad advice. The Bible tells us that Amnon had a friend named Jonadab. And he listened to some bad advice. And it brought a lot of heartache to the family. How are you going to miss the will of God? You're going to listen to some bad advice. You say, oh, but this is what my doctor said. Doesn't mean he's always right. Well, this is what my psychiatrist said. Doesn't mean it's, he's always right. Well, this is what my pastor said. Doesn't even mean he's always right. Hmm? Don't listen to bad advice unless you want to miss the will of God. So, don't listen to bad advice. Verse 12, he missed the will of God by looking for the easy way. The haven was not commodious to winter in. Yeah, it's going to get, get cold. The more part advised to depart. Yeah, they said, we, we, need, we need to get out here. Paul said, don't, don't, don't go. Going to be damaged to the ship and possibly to our lives. Don't do it, don't do it. No, but look, it's not going to, it's going to get cold here. The time is passing by. We need to get going. And uh, so be quiet, Paul. We're going. If we stay here, it's going to get rough. Did you know that the will of God is not always smooth sailing? Amen. In fact, the will of God can be some of the bumpiest ride you've ever had in your life. But they were thinking, let's sail while the seas are peaceful. We've got to find a safer haven to be in. So here we go. The will of God is not always comfortable. I, I don't want to start a controversy. But I've seen more missionaries come home from the field since COVID started because the country wouldn't allow them to stay in the country if they didn't take the vaccine. Some of them said, I wouldn't mind taking it myself, but I'm not going to let them do, do my children. Okay, if that's your conviction, come back home. But if God called you to go to a certain country and preach the gospel, are you really going to turn your back on a call, the gift of the calling of God is without repentance? You like to sort that out between you and the Lord, okay? I, you may quit listening to me preach when I say this, but I took, I took the vaccines because I was traveling all over the world in missionary works. I didn't want to take the vaccine. I thought it was probably dangerous, maybe even deadly. No telling what it was going to do. All my kids would probably be born naked. <laughs> or some other terrible side effect. But I just went ahead and took the vaccine. Took all of them. Two shots, two boosters. However many they gave, that's how many I took. Still, I got the card right here in my passport. So if I want to go to a country, I got proof I've been vaccinated. I'm not telling you to do it, okay? 
I'm not even telling you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. I'm saying, but quit being critical of people who believe they've got a good reason to do what they did. And if I'm going to get into Ukraine and Romania, and if I'm going to get into Paraguay and Colombia, South America, I had to take the vaccine. Okay, I could just stay home and say, no, I'm not doing it. But is your priority your, your preference or even your conviction? Or is your priority the will of God? Which is getting the gospel in all the world. It's just a matter of what's your priority. The will of God is not always comfortable. The will of God is not always pleasant. The will of God is not always easy to swallow. And one way people miss the will of God, they have their own set of standards and beliefs that are even bigger than the great commission of getting the gospel in all the world. My wife also travels worldwide, having ladies' conferences. She goes to Paraguay every year. She goes to Israel every year. She goes to the Navajo Reservation in Arizona every year. She goes to Bogota, Colombia every year. She was going to Bogota when the cartels controlled half of the city. She's always saying, you want to go? Nope. (laughs) I'm not a gray-headed little old lady. They're going to see Americano, mucho dinero. Let's get him. He pastors church that gives a million dollars to missions. Wonder how much they will give for him. No, baby, you just go. I'll pray. <laughs> hmm. If you're going to do the mission work to fulfill the Great Commission, it may not always be comfortable. My wife stays in a motel in one of those places that you would not want to stay in. You wouldn't want to stay there. Your wife would be having something to say if you put her in that room. You, 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 we're going to stay in here for a week? There's always ladies saying, can I go with you on one of those trips? Yes. Which one do you want to go to? And they'll tell her. She'll say, mm, I'm not sure you're ready for that one. Yeah. And when you get back, you're going to have to leave your suitcase in the car for three days to kill all the bed bugs. And you're going to have to treat your hair, and you're going to have to do this, and you're going to have to do that. Are you ready for that? Ooh, no. Then you better just stay home. The will of God is not always comfortable. Amen. Church problems can get uncomfortable. Business pressures can get uncomfortable. Family problems can get uncomfortable. You cannot let those divert you from the will of God for your life. But it'll be a challenge at times because you're going to look for the easy way out. Let me find a will of God that's (laughs) smooth sailing, commodious to winter in. Let me find the will of God where everything is like I want it to be. There is no such thing. There is no such thing. It's sacrifice. It's self-denial. It's putting up with people. It's putting up with yourself while you do the will of God for the gospel's sake. He missed the will of God because he looked for the easy way out. And uh, he missed the will of God because he believed in majority rule. He believed in democracy. Majority rule. Yeah, you're going to miss the will of God right there. 
almost every time. Because the majority are carnal. They're ruled by what their flesh wants. That's the majority. You can prove that from the Bible. Send 12 spies, two of them will get it right. Huh? Two out of 12. That's one sixth. That's like 16 and two thirds percent. Somewhere in that ballpark. That's about how many people will get it right. So if you're going to have a vote, be sure of one thing. The majority are wrong. You don't believe that? Have an election. The majority of your nation is wrong. The majority of our nation is wrong. The majority rule only works if the majority have good sense. We're past that. Way past that. In America, we have Republicans who believe in rule by constitution. Here's our constitution. And we have Democrats who rule by majority vote. Let the majority rule. Churches want to operate the same way. They don't want to rule by constitution. They want to get everybody's opinion and have a vote and then wonder why the church struggles. Amen. You can take that or leave it. But I'm just telling you how you can miss the will of God. And churches have excelled in this. Now the Bible said there's safety in a multitude of counselors. Here's my take on that verse. You can take it or leave it. The reason the Bible said there's safety in a, in a and a multitude of counselors is because you got to ask a multitude of people before one will get it right. You got to have the discernment to know who got it right. If you ask 12 people anything, what they think about something, more than likely only one or two of them will get it right. So if you ask your five best friends, they're probably all five going to get it wrong. They think just like you do. Which is why you were asking them to begin with. You wanted to ask your buddies who will tell you what you want to hear. No, you need to find some cranky old cuss. What do you think about this? And he's going to tell you something that's so off the wall, you're going to think, this guy's crazy. But then you're going to go home and you're going to think about it and you're going to think, you know... I don't know what's wrong with me, but that's beginning to make sense to me. Now what am I going to do? Don't let the majority rule. They're usually wrong. Let me ask you this. Where are there going to be more people? Heaven or hell? That tells you right there the majority of the people are messed up in the way they're thinking. They're messed up. So, don't let the majority rule. Well, preacher, we need to have a vote on whatever. Are you going to do, the most carnal person in the church will have the most to say. You say, how do you know? Experience. They've been sitting there thinking about it and can't wait to express their opinion. Does anybody have a word that they'd like to say? Bing. Mr. Carnal will be the first one on his feet. And he will take his time once he gets to his feet. And if you'll let him, he'll come up to the pulpit to give his opinion. Yeah, yeah Pastor, I got something that I'd like to say. God's put something on my heart. And, uh, and, and he'll come up there and he'll just start trying to edge you out of the way. Now, what do you do when that happens, Pastor? My old preacher said, this is what you do. 
and put both hands on that pulpit and say, sir, you just stand right there and have your say. He said, because there's authority that goes with this pulpit. And if you step aside and let that man in that pulpit and let him talk for 30 minutes, next thing you know, he's going to call for a vote of confidence. And when he gets through telling everybody his laundry list of complaints against you, he's going to turn people's hearts away from you. You never open up a church meeting to discussion that allows anybody to get in that pulpit and start talking. Amen. You can take it or leave it. You can miss the will of God if you want to. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. Give Mr. Carnal the pulpit for 30 minutes and you will have more fires than you can put out in the next six years. I could call a pastor's name right now. That very thing happened to him. I said, tell me how that worked. It was exactly what I said. The guy came up there and said, I don't have something I'd like to say. Pastor stepped aside, gave him the pulpit, the microphone, and two weeks later, pastor was voted out of the church. Mr. Carnell is still in control because he believed in what? Majority rule. You want to miss the will of God? Let the majority rule. That's true in Canadian politics. That's true in the United States politics. And that's true in a local church. Learn to follow the favorable circumstances. Verse 13, and I'm done. The south wind blew softly. And supposing we had obtained our purpose, Paul had a word from God. These people were supposing that this was the will of God. That's dangerous. In fact, by the favorable circumstances, somebody had probably said, God, we need a sign. Show us a sign. And here came that soft wind. That south wind just started blowing across there and it felt so good. And they said, yep, yeah, this is the will of God right here. Most sermons that I've heard on how to find the will of God say you find the will of God by the word of God, by the counsel of people you have confidence in, and by circumstances that God puts into place. The only one of those that you can depend on is the Word of God. None of the others are dependable. Well, don't you believe God works through circumstances? Yes, but don't you believe Satan can work through circumstances? Amen. Satan can give you favorable circumstances, especially if you're praying for a sign. The devil loves it when Christians ask for a sign. Is this the will of God? Give me a sign. Yeah. Soft, wind, commodious. Oh, it's a sign from God. This is the will of God. Let's sail on for the glory of God. Jonah is the illustration of that. God said, go to Nineveh and preach. Jonah didn't want to go because he was a racist. Right? Are we still in the book when I say that? He didn't like Ninevites. He wanted God to kill them. He hated them. So, he no doubt prayed and said, Lord, I need a sign. I'm going to go down there to the dock and the first ship that I come to, let it be the will of God. And he went down there and he found a ship going to Tarshish. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. I just missed the will of God on that whole Nineveh thing. Here's the will of God. It's a sign from God. 
this ship is not going to Nineveh, it's going to Tarshish. He said, I need a ticket to uh, Tarshish. How much is that? And they told him. He pulled his money out. And, You're not going to believe this? To the dollar. He had exactly the amount of money to buy the ticket to go to Tarshish. Confirmation. This is a will of God. So you know what he did then? He got on that boat. He went down into the inner part of that boat and went sound asleep. He had the other thing that people are always preaching about the will of God. He had peace about it. You know why he had peace? Number one, the decision's made now. He can quit struggling with the decision. Number two, he's got the decision he wants instead of the will of God. So, pressure's off. He goes in there, goes down in there, goes sound asleep. But ends up in the whale's belly. Because he's out of the will of God, not in the will of God. Because he wanted to follow the favorable circumstances. To go where he wanted to go instead of where God told him to go. Don't look for what you want. Look for what God wants. Don't listen to what everybody else says. Listen to what God says when he speaks to your heart. And what he told you at the beginning of the whole thing was probably the will of God. And all this other stuff that's happened to you since is your effort to get the will of God to line up with what you want. That's how you miss the will of God. Father, bless the message. Encourage somebody's heart, maybe that's in here looking for the will of God, that they'll avoid these pitfalls and find your perfect will and enjoy the great blessings of being in the will of God for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Because Lord, there's nothing like being in your will to satisfy the heart. And I pray, Father, that you'd help every man to lead his family, every woman to have confidence in him, and every child to believe that our parents are trying to do what's best and right. And Lord, then the whole church will work so much more smoothly if everybody will just get in the will of God and be content. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.